Yes, sir. So it is the third day of lectures so of Professor Maiani. It's the lecture number five on the multi quark hadrons. See. Va bene, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to stay with you until now. And uh, we have arrived to the fifth uh, uh, lecture, uh, speaking about the 3872 and the, its missing partners. This is a, a, a sort of a defense, a defensive uh, uh, argument. In a way, we expected and we still expect uh, that uh, on top of X3872, there is another neutral partner and around uh, there is a charged, a similar charged partner. Uh, uh, and and this, this particle has not been seen until now. So we, are, we have tried to understand whether they, why, the reason why, or at least give some explanation to suggest what to do. I, I, in the lecture that I gave yesterday, I stressed that uh, um, in, the, in, the, in the case where uh, exotic hadrons are made of, of many quarks bound by uh, QCD forces, uh, they must form complete multiples. And uh, so X3872, which is the, the um, strangeness zero level, has to uh, include in all four states. We see one, uh, where are the other three? And that is, the, that is the, the scope of my lecture, to provide some reasonable reason why uh, they have not been seen now and to provide the indications where to see these partners. Um, the, 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 most of, the, of this time, I will have to go to do with the violation of isospin symmetry in strong interactions. And uh, mm, now in, in the origin, the beginning, people thought they, that in fact, the strong interactions are fully symmetric under isospin and isospin was, is broken only by electromagnetic interactions, which all obviously break uh, charge independence. And, uh, one, for instance, one calculation, which is um, for some time ago, showed that uh, the pi plus pi zero mass difference can be, can be um, almost perfectly reconstructed by a purely electromagnetic calculation. But this is not the whole story, because uh, all the calculation of the electromagnetic uh, mass differences of proton and neutron tend gave uh, the wrong result. They gave that proton must be heavier than the neutron. This is sort of obvious because proton is charged and therefore it, it has a, a additional energy with respect to the neutron. But in fact, it is not so. We know very well that the neutron is heavier than the proton. On top of the electromagnetic corrections, already Coleman and Glashow long ago made the hypothesis that there is a part of the strong interaction Lagrangian, they call it the tadpole, that is responsible for an additional violation of isospin independently from electromagnetism. And uh, for baryons, uh, several indications are that uh, this part, in fact, dominates the mass difference proton minus neutron, which is everybody knows is minus 1.4 MeV. So the opposite sign that would be predicted by electromagnetism. Now the tadpole idea has been incorporated in QCD by uh, observing that a, a different in mass of the up and down quark uh, would produce a, a Lagrangian, a term in the Lagrangian, which we call L3 yesterday. And uh, um, this has, has three, therefore, as a well-defined transformation properties under the symmetries, just like the tadpole of Coleman and Glashow. And this is, this is it. The, the real point is, what is M, M up minus M down? In other words, we would like to have a, a precision determination of the quark masses to see whether we can compare that, the effect of L3 with the experiment. Now, um, okay, this is it. Now, uh, the, 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 
the the way that uh, more precisely uh, uh, meson mass, uh, masses are related to quark masses is via violation of chiral symmetry. As, uh, as I think you all know, uh, we can write axial currents for the quarks and uh, um, this, uh, the, 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 for instance, A1, the, the axial current is, uh, is, is not conserved using the Dirac equation, you can see that the divergence of a, a mu a, a one is just a, a proportional to the sum of the quark up and down masses and the so-called pseudoscalar density, P1. And uh, so you are led to introduce a full set of scalar and pseudoscalar densities, which are an octet of SU3. And it is very well known since a long time that this satisfy um, uh, uh, commutation relations. And uh, all in all, if you put together the, the vector and axial vector current and the, the pseudoscalar and scalar densities, then you have a set of what is called word identities. That is identities which, uh, uh, which um, arise when you multiply by Q mu the, um, the the correlation function of one current and say one pseudoscalar density, you use the commutation relations and uh, you bring Q mu uh, multiplied by the exponential is just uh, the derivative. You bring the derivative to the time order product and there are two terms, terms in which the derivative came directly to the current. This is the first, uh, this is the first term and uh, a term which is uh, takes into account the fact that the time order product has in itself a theta function of a t. And so the derivative of a theta function is a delta function and you get an equal time commutator, which is very well known. And uh, as I will show, a battery of these uh, word identities and, uh, and, uh, and the commutator uh, can give a, a connection between the meson masses and the quark masses, which is different from the one that we found uh, before in the in the constituent conch model, and in fact gives a different result, which I will comment later. Now, uh, first of all, I have, to, however, to tell you uh, to recall that uh, uh, in the limit of quark masses, as, as we have seen, chiral symmetry is exact. Now, an exact symmetry can be realized uh, with the exact multiplets like uh, QCD or whatever, and uh, however, can also be spontaneously broken. And uh, that leads to the Godson theorem and to the fact that a, 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 a spontaneous symmetry broken theory has uh, uh, massless particles. And long ago, long, long ago, Jonah Lazzino and Nambu proposed uh, chiral symmetry to be spontaneously broken with the pion be the approximately massless Goldstone boson. Quark mass would then give a non-vanishing pion mass and uh, the violation of uh, chirality due to the quark masses would reflect into non-vanishing uh, meson masses. That, that's the idea. Now, of course, uh, a, a symmetry, chiral symmetry, as you think, or as you think, can be broken spontaneously in many ways. But uh, the way that uh, we find the more reasonable, and, and we are not able to compute that, is uh, to say that uh, what, is, what uh, uh, breaks spontaneously uh, the chiral symmetry is a vacuum expectation value of the scalar density, which is an SU3 singlet. This is a very attractive idea because uh, uh, assuming that the vacuum expectation value of zero of S zero is non-zero and all the others are zero means that SU3 flavor is an exact symmetry. And we know from what I said before that this is precisely what happens in, uh, in, um, in QCD without, without uh, um, uh, broken by the quark mass. So we are going to follow this idea, which has been worked out uh, 
time ago by Gelman, Oaks, and Renner, and by Glashow and Weinberg in the uh, end of the 60s, and uh, take this idea that, uh, that you have a vacuum expectation value of the scalar density, uh, SU3 singlet, and correspondingly, you have quark masses, and these quark masses determine the masses of the pseudoscalar mesons, which without the quark masses would be the goldstone bosons of this symmetry. This is the, the, the general idea. And uh, now we, we can uh, work it out. Uh, the, this, is, uh, this is again the, the, the word identity, but now I'm going to live in a world in which uh, uh, quark masses are different from zero. So there are no goldstone bosons. Uh, there are no massless particles. And uh, so multiplying by Q mu, the, the first line and letting Q mu go into zero, I get zero because there is no, no pole at zero mass. So I, I'm left with zero equal the other two terms. I bring uh, the, the third term on the other side. And so the first term contains uh, the time order product of the derivative of the axial current. And this, as we have seen, is just m, u, m up plus m down divided by two times the time order product of two pseudoscalar uh, densities. And the other part can be computed with the equal time commutators of, uh, of charges and, uh, and uh, densities. And it just uh, a, a coefficient times the vacuum expectation value of S0. It would have also other terms, but these other terms, which are the vacuum expectation value of S3 and S8 are zero. So, so uh, you left with one term. Now you make another approximation, the time order product of P1 and P1, you saturate with uh, uh, a meson propagator. In this case, it is the propagator of the pi plus, and, uh, and uh, you write it as a constant divided by q square minus m pi square, and q square is equal to zero. So the second, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, right-hand side of the equation is a constant, and the left-hand side is the ratio of m up plus m down and m pi square. That means that m up plus m down is a constant times m pi square. And you can repeat uh, this for the other currents and for the other mesons, uh, eliminate the constant, and uh, you get uh, a wonderful, wonderful relation, which, uh, which is uh, that, uh, that uh, the, the, the ratio of quark masses, m up plus m down, divided by the mass of the strange plus m up plus m down over two, is just the ratio of a certain combination of the square masses of the pseudoscalar meson phi and k. And this ratio is uh, numerically 0 0.077. 77. And uh, if you assume that uh, you take ms from the equal spacing of the, of the, of the um, decuplet, in other words, you say that uh, the, the up and down quark masses are, are small, and this ms is essentially equal to ms minus m up, then uh, you get uh, uh, very small values for the quark masses of up and down, m up plus m down about 12, uh, divided by two, about six MeV. This was in fact a big surprise, but uh, it, it, it's, uh, ju it, 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 what it says is that uh, the world is very close to the chiral limit. In other words, uh, the mass of the pion being what it is, uh, the mass of the up and down quark which break the chiral symmetry are very small, very small on the other scale. This is the main result of uh, 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 Gelman, Ox and Renner and, and Glashow and Weinberg. But to this, you can add another consideration, which I'm not going to demonstrate, which is uh, the, that Dashen, Roger Dashen, has shown that this combination of, uh, of uh, kaon and, uh, and pion masses is not affected by the electromagnetic correction. This is a non-renormalization theorem. 
If you do that, then you will insert into this combination the previous equations that I had, and you get an equation for m up minus m down. And uh, it's a very small number indeed, it's minus 0 0.021. The minus sign tells you a good thing, that the up quark is lighter than the down quark. So proton will be lighter than, than the neutron. And in total now, you can uh, um, obtain, again, using a mass equal under 50 MeV, you obtain two values for the mass of the up and down quark, and the difference is 3.3 uh, MeV, while individually the masses are very close to this difference. Uh, M up turns out to be 4 MeV and uh, M down about 7.6 7 MeV. We uh, noted, uh, working in the constituent quark model, that uh, the, the, the equal spacing of the uh, delta resonances uh, are not all due to the, to, the mass, uh, to the mass difference strange minus uh, up or strange minus uh, down. But uh, there is also a contribution which comes from the hyperfine interaction. And if you take out that, mm, you, you get an estimate for MS, which is a little larger, is 180 MeV, and you get uh, slightly different uh, uh, masses for the up and down quark, but that doesn't change uh, anything. And in fact, I'm going to ignore this, uh, this uh, finesse. And uh, it will give that uh, the difference uh, up and down uh, quark mass is uh, more close to, to 4 MeV than to 3 MeV. But I'm not going to, to push on that. I must say, uh, I'm very proud of this uh, fact that uh, the first who noticed it, this fact, uh, very important, that, that uh, um, the, the quark masses up and down have a mass difference, which is the, of the same order of their masses, where uh, Nicola Kabibo and I, in, in a paper which came even before the unification, we arrived to this conclusion and we were very worried because it would seem that uh, uh, such a the, percentually, if you make the mass difference uh, divided by the sum of the mass of the quark, you get an enormous effect. But this is not so. The fact is that uh, all the physical quantities of particles are very close to the chiral limit, and in the chiral limit, everything is, is zero, even this uh, uh, isospin break. So it, it, there is no contradiction with data. And in fact, uh, as I tried to say, the presence of this uh, tadpole part of this uh, mass difference, of quark mass difference, is uh, welcome to understand the properties of the particle, uh, properties of elementary particles. Now, now uh, a conclusion to this is to recall you that uh, what we found uh, with the constituent quark model is a much larger masses. Uh, however, however, the diff I noticed already that the difference of the up uh, of the light quark and strange quark taken from meso and taken from baryons is uh, insensitive to that. And uh, that means that uh, the additional energy which is uh, pumped into the quark mass at the low energy by the Q QCD interaction um, obeys this fact that the quark mass difference are related to violation of, of symmetries and they have to be uh, fixed to be the same for uh, constituent quark and for what we call the, 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 the um, uh, current quark. I'm not going to say that we understand perfectly this fact, the difference between constituent and quark mass, but uh, uh, until now we didn't find any large in inconsistency. Now, Coming back to isospin breaking, uh, there is a, a more recent work than uh, Coleman and Glashow by Karliner and Rosner, which um, tried to have a fit of the uh, isospin breaking mass differences in baryons uh, in terms of few parameters. Uh, for, of course, these parameters, but the basic parameter was the, the, the radius 
of, uh, of the, of the um, dye quark inside the, the baryon. And, uh, uh, in, uh, sorry, and, um, and, uh, uh, never mind. I'm coming. Okay. And uh, they quote uh, a number, uh, which is uh, a, a, a quantity, which is A, which is essentially alpha times one over R which is the electrostatic energy of uh, which is stored inside the dye quark. And this is about 2.83 2 MeV, which would correspond to a radius of the dye quark inside the proton, say, uh, of the order of half a Fermi. We, we will come back to that. Now let's go now to, to, to the, to the uh, tetra quark and uh, an idea which uh, Antonello, Veronica, and I pursued for some time is the idea that uh, diquark and anti diquark are separated. They are not one on top of the other, but there is a, 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 a barrier among them. And it seemed to us that that was the, the only explanation of this uh, fact that, that, that I told you that uh, the hyperfine interaction inside the diquark is much larger than the hyperfine interaction between the, the, the constituent of the quark and the constituent of the anti-diquark. And uh, so we, we follow this, this idea, which, which has been also entertained by, by other authors. And, uh, um, and, and, so, and then what happened? Well, if you follow this idea, uh, uh, there are two lengths in, into the, 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 the tetra quark. One is the radius of the dye quark, and the other one is the radius of the tetra quark. And th they are two different scales. And we try to, to use that but to explain a fact that uh, was very surprising for us, that is that if I take only the quark mass differences, electromagnetic uh, isospin breaking, uh, which, as I said, uh, M up minus M down is something like minus three MeV multiplied by two does make something like minus six MeV. If I take that as the only isospin breaking, then that should be a charged or another neutral uh, um, exotic state uh, within six MeV from the X3872. And there is no trace until now for that. So we try to see whether uh, by this picture of the tetra quark, uh, we could understand a, a close degeneracy between, a closer degeneracy between these two particles uh, than that implied by the quark mass differences. And uh, the Carliner the and Rosner gave a, a handle on that. As I said, they mm, uh, quantify the ele electrostatic energy inside the baryons with this parameter A. Of course, uh, uh, we know already that uh, the, the radius of the tetra quark must be, of the dye quark must be smaller than the radius of the dye quark inside the proton because of the kappa, which is, uh, and, we, and, kappa, and kappa scales like, uh, like one of a R cube. So we, uh, first thing we, we can say that uh, for, for tetra quarks, there are the uh, tetra quarks, the radius of the dye quark inside the, the X, let's say, is a, a quite smaller than the radius of the um, tetra quark inside the proton. And, uh, and therefore, the, 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 there is a, a, a larger electrostatic energy which uh, favors the up, up quark, the diquark UC versus the diquark DC, because UC have the same, U and C have the same sign of the charge, and D and C have an opposite charge. And if you make the difference of the electrostatic um, energy, you find, uh, you find this, um, this formula that uh, X, uh, MXU, that is the tetra quark made by UC, U bar C bar, and XD made the tetra quark DC, D bar C bar, 
is this four third a prime, where a prime is the analogous um, parameter at the Carliner one, but applied to the tetra quark, and of course means that the radius has to be rescaled with the radius of the tetra quark inside the X. This is, and you see that this is in fact as a plus sign, delta M is, is negative, is minus 60 MeV, but this uh, energy tends to give, a, to reduce in absolute value this. Then there is another term, which um, instead as the other energy, is the repulsion or attraction between the diquark and the anti-diquark. And this, of course, it, it, it goes in the other direction. It's, uh, it, it prefers uh, a heavier uh, U, U, UC, uh, XU and, and with respect to XD, but this goes down like lambda, one over lambda, where lambda is the ratio between the radio of the tetraquark and the, radi and the radius of the diquark. And in the table, you see what happens for lambda equal one. Lambda equal one, the two terms uh, essentially uh, cancel one each other, and you are left with the original estimate of minus six MeV. But if lambda is uh, something like three, then of course uh, uh, the, di the difference x u minus x d can be of the order of one MeV. One MeV is much better than six MeV. To, to say that the two things coalesce inside the line seen by the, the X3872. What are the parameters that come out of this analysis? Well, you have that the dike quark is a 0 0.3, 0 0.3 Fermi, and the X tetra quark will be about one Fermi. So uh, the tetra quark will be a little larger than, say, the proton. But, uh, but uh, not so much. So we consider that um, a reasonable picture. And uh, therefore, that means that it could be that the, the resolution of the puzzle, why we don't see two neutral uh, uh, X3872, is just a matter of resolution. And increasing the resolution, you will see two lines instead of only one at 3872. Now, what is the present situation? The present situation is uh, this one. It, these are the latest data of LHCB. And uh, well, what can I say? You see that the resolution, the large, the, the, the resolution of the experiment is essentially the width that you see. Uh, um, and, uh, and uh, Inside this week, there are wiggles, etc. Now, can we imagine that if you increase by a factor of five or ten the resolution, this line will split into two lines at different at different uh, close by one MeV? Well, for the moment, I think this is possible. So we can we can uh, ask uh, our friends to to go further and uh, perhaps. Uh, um, we will discover that uh, there is a, a two lines there. For the moment, we, we are not obliged to abandon this idea. That is for the, the neutral XA, XU and XD. Now, what about the charged one? Well, if you do the same uh, mass formula, you, you can see, in fact, it was in my table, you can see that uh, we predict uh, the 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 x up the the x plus to be about uh, more than one one three mev larger than x a x u and uh, that means that its decay would be only uh, j psi let me go now back With this estimate, sorry, with this estimate, uh, the, the, the decay of B into K plus X, pa, X plus, then we'll have the X plus decaying into J psi plus rho plus. And the rho plus decays into pi plus pi zero. And it's very difficult to see, uh, uh, to close an event like that because mo in most of the cases you will lose the two, the two gammas of the pi zero decay. 
So we made an analysis of all these decays that have been seen um, in which uh, uh, in the B decays you see B decay in K plus X uh, neutral or charged and uh, to see which was, which could be a limit to the branching ratio of B into K X plus. This is the, this is what, uh, what we would like to have. And to do that, uh, we have analyzed, as you will see, this decays. But before that, let me make a, a comment. There has been a very recent result of uh, G, of X, uh, the decay X 3872 into rho zero psi divided by omega psi that, uh, that shows quite a, a sensible violation of isospin which has to be expected, of course, in the tetra quark. And uh, this has to be compared with this very small violation of uh, isospin, which has seen in Charmonia decay as, uh, as exemplified, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, as exemplified by the, uh, exemplified by the second formula. Uh, sorry. I hope that now it stays. Now we have uh, used this data to reanalyze uh, uh, the other, the older uh, ratios that I showed you before. We we had done that a couple of years a couple of years ago, but we have uh, reinserted this value, and uh, mm, we have considered all the observed decays, which are B, that say for instance B plus B bar U which goes into C bar uh, and CS bar. This is the, the weak decay allowed and uh, plus an additional uh, quark antiquark pair. And uh, so this is uh, the way in which you can see the decay into K plus and a tetra quark. And uh, if, if uh, notice that the, the charm, the, the quark pair, uh, coming out of the sea is made of the same flavor. So it's a UU bar or DD bar or SS bar. So in other words, you will be able to produce XU to produce XD, but also to produce X plus because nothing prevents you to make the K plus not with the up quark, which is the spectator in BDK, but we an up quark picked up from the vacuum pairs. And this is what is, uh, 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 what is said in this uh, line. Um, if, you, uh, if you consider the decay B plus in XD, K plus, you have only one diagram, which is the one in which uh, in the green uh, pair uh, cuckoo bar, you make DD bar. That's only, the, that's only this possibility. But if you make, uh, if you want to see the decay B plus XU plus K plus, uh, then uh, the, the K plus can take either the up, which is the spectator quark, or the up from the pair U U bar. And uh, in this case, uh, you have two amplitudes, which we call the A1 and A2. And you analyze all the possible decays with these two amplitudes. Uh, all decays uh, can be classified according to these amplitudes. Of course, uh, you have to take into account the possible mixing between X up and X down, which is given by this angle uh, sin, sin phi and cos phi. And, uh, and then, buying on our picture that X up and X down are degenerate inside the, 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 the X3872, uh, you simply have to make the square and add up the rates for X up and X down. This is the, the, the reason. It's like the experiment in which you have two, two, two holes and the diffraction to the two holes. You, 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 you have no interference in this case. And uh, uh, then, then this is uh, the result. Uh, uh, the, 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 there are three regions, uh, yellow, uh, brown, and green. 
that correspond to the three values of the three ratios within errors. And uh, they should meet uh, in, a, in a point. And uh, uh, with the one standard deviation, there is some difficulty in, in meeting them. So we, we, I plotted the case in which you take two standard deviations. And uh, the red cross gives um, one solution which, uh, which uh, will correspond to a given value of the mixing angle and to a given value of the ratio between A1, A2, and A1. And uh, what is the use of that? Uh, well, I, I, let me not comment, uh, I, can, I can not to make too complicated, let me not comment that there are, there are two possible re regions intersect here, so there will be two solutions, but the other solution doesn't fit well with the decay of the strange B, of the BS into, uh, into uh, K pi, Kx. And so uh, the, the red cross is the only acceptable solution. And with these things all specified, uh, the mixing angle and Z, you can compute directly what is the rate for, um, for um, B0, which goes into X plus, uh, K plus, um, no, B, B plus, uh, B0, which goes into K plus X minus, which is uh, the, the thing that we are interested. And uh, you see that uh, uh, with the present analysis and within the errors, you get uh, 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 that uh, this ratio must be less than 25%. Now, what is the present limit? The present limit is essentially less than one. And so, uh, but, le but one would correspond to a enormous isospin equal one X 3872, which is not really uh, a reasonable assumption. And uh, this is a much more precise uh, assumption and, uh, and uh, it gives you a, a, a value, which is a sort of uh, four times, uh, uh, less than what is the present the present limit. So I think uh, we can go to to the to the conclusion of, of this lecture. Uh, I showed you the way that with chiral symmetry we can obtain the masses of the the current mass of the quarks, and in particular we can obtain a good value for the mass difference of up and down uh, quark masses. Uh, as I said, the, the, uh, the understanding of uh, uh, how, what is the relation between uh, um, the constituent quark masses and the current and current quark masses is uh, not uh, perfect, so to be optimistic. And uh, however, there are elements that can uh, help in this way. And uh, we hope that uh, the, the lattice QCD calculations, which have a unique definition of the quark mass, uh, uh, will throw some light on that. Concerning our problem of the partners of X, we uh, found a defensive line to the fact that none of them has, has been observed until now. And uh, the first is resolution. Uh, there could be two lines under the single line that we see uh, for the X3872 and uh, statistics. Can we go to branch infraction much well, well below one to see the X plus uh, decaying into J psi rho plus? And uh, we hope that time will tell. This is not the first time that uh, to defend the theory, you have to go to the extremes and to say that uh, something new should happen by improving the experimental uh, capability to investigate. Sometimes in the history, a defense like that has succeeded. Sometimes it has failed. Uh, if it fails, I would see. Uh, I would say that uh, we should abandon the idea that, that the X. Is, uh, is something which is made by quarks and bound by QCD forces, which uh, includes, uh, which uh, requires the, pre the presence of partners uh, of all kinds. 
and uh, and um, we will see if uh, what will time bring. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Maiani. So maybe before having a break, uh, I ask for questions. So. Yes, I actually have a question. Um, can you hear me properly? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so if I recall correctly, there was mention of the diquark radius, uh, at, at specifically the diquark inside of the nucleon. Is that, am I, am I right about that? Inside of the proton perhaps? Sorry, what, what is the question? The question is first, uh, the first preliminary question. If I recall correctly, there was a mention of the diquark radius inside of the proton. Is that right? Yes. Yes. I mean, okay. uh, it is well known that uh, in the proton you have uh, three quarks. And uh, uh, you can analyze that as a diquark plus another quark. The, 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 the diquark, two quarks are all in three bar. So they make a, a diquark in the Jaffe sense. And, uh, and uh, the correction to the violation to the, to, sorry, the correction to quark mass difference uh, um, due to the quark mass difference, the two isos being breaking due to the quark mass difference provides you with an estimate of the electrostatic energy of which is stored in two quarks into the proton. And uh, that is the, the estimate that uh, Carlina et al. Uh, have done. And uh, this would correspond to a radius of uh, 0.3 Fermi, as, as I said. But uh, the radius of the baryon is a little larger because there is a, another quark. So in fact, we know that the radius of the proton is about 0.7 Fermi or something like that. Is that answering? Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, I, I wasn't familiar with, with the details of the calculation. I was going to ask if there was some sort of average of, over the uh, isoscalar, scalar, and uh, axial vector diquark contributions from, from the different uh, pairings of uh, the two quarks. Uh, but, uh, but anyways, it seems like it's a completely different approach in terms of the oh, average uh, electromagnetic. No, we are speaking of uh, the constituent quarks, and there is no ax axial vector. The, the constituent quark is a, is a, is a spin one half particle or, or almost at rest. So there is no question, there is no issue of uh, vector or axial currents in this case. You simply add uh, what, what Carlin, I'm referring to what Carlin and, and, uh, and Rosner did. You take all the baryons. And uh, there are all the mass differences uh, well measured. So we know many, many of these mass differences. And then you try to fit these mass uh, differences with a formula which has one fixed element, which is the difference in quark mass up minus down. First. And second, the electrostatic energies uh, stored in the quarks which of course depend, uh, for, for each pair, depends from one over their average distance. So you have one parameter, which is uh, one over R, and, uh, and then you have another parameter, which is uh, the difference of quark masses. And then you have another parameter, which comes from the hyperfine interaction, spin-spin interaction due to the electromagnetism. And, uh, you fit all the masses with this parameter, obtain a reasonable fit, and you get the average distance of, in fact, the average one over R distance of two quarks inside the barrier. And this is the parameter that they gave. And we are using that, extrapolating to the case of the tetra quark, in which you have a, a different geometry because you have a di quark on one side and then another and an anti di quark on the other. And we try, we find the results that I just uh, illustrated. Okay, thanks. That's very thank illuminating you. in terms of how the calculation happens. So thank you. Very good. Uh, are there other questions?
Okay. Okay, seems not, but we are perfectly on time. I think we can have uh, some minutes of break. Yes. If, uh, and then we continue. Okay, that was the introduction. So I, I, I will now go to the first slide and so you will see what I was talking about. The, there are cases in which we have a, a mixed system with heavy particles and light particles. And uh, this is a case where uh, we can apply a method which was devised uh, long ago at the time of quantum mechanics by Born and Oppenheimer. And uh, it, it, it's, uh, this, it takes this name, a Born Oppenheimer approximation, in which uh, you try to decouple the, the light, uh, uh, the light uh, degrees of freedom from the heavy degrees of freedom. And this is a very natural scheme if you want to treat the molecules in which there are the nuclei which are heavy and the electrons which are light. But uh, in, in our business, exotic hadrons, we have similar system because uh, uh, for instance, in this, uh, in this, um, this transparency that I have, you have uh, a, a case in which uh, you have a, a, a quark with two heavy quarks, uh, the case of a double charm baryon, which has been uh, observed uh, recently, and uh, cases where you have only one uh, heavy particle and like and the light quark, which is depicted here. Now, in these cases, we try to apply Born-Oppenheimer to the, to the case of the double, double heavy baryon or double heavy uh, tetraquark, but uh, I want to uh, say that there's been a, a, sim a particular symmetry in this case, which uh, is not so evident a priori, and it's the following. If uh, I consider this doubly, doubly heavy baryon, if I let the mass of the charm core go to infinity, say I consider for instance two Bs or two top <laughs> quark, uh, then of course the two heavy particles will collapse one on top of the other. And uh, the, the, the quantum, the, and since these two party, two quarks are in a three bar of color, the, the QCD conf field configuration seen by the light quark will be exactly the same as that in the uh, in the body in the bezon in which there is only one quark one heavy quark of course there are two differences one is the fact that the mass of the heavy source is two times the mass of the heavy source in the in the meson but this is easy to account for because uh, you want to describe the energy, you simply add or subtract the mass of the heavy particle. But then there is another thing uh, concerning the spin-spin interaction, the hyperfine interaction that we have seen uh, uh, make part of the, of the mass of the meson. And uh, in the case of the meson, you have a spin-spin interaction of a three and three bar to go into uh, a singlet. In the case of the baryon, you have a, a, a hyperfine interaction of, of a tree with a tree, the uh, Q and the charm, and, and the charm, and the, the, but the two charm are, are spin one. So again, you have a possibility for J, total J to be one half and three half in the baryon case and zero and one in the meson case. And uh, 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 this particular symmetry um, allows you to find a, a relation between uh, uh, the between the, the the difference in mass of the spin three half and the spin one half baryon and the spin and the difference in mass of the of the meson uh, with spin half and the meson with spin zero and there is this factor of three quarter that can be is a very interesting exercise for a beginner. And my question is try to find out uh, this uh, three quarter from the formula that uh, were given in uh, two, two, le two lectures ago concerning the spectrum of uh, uh, the, the constituent quarks uh, spectrum of, of uh, the mesons and the baryons. So um, I think that Alessandro can eventually um, comment on that. 
uh, this particular symmetry has been discovered some time ago and the possibility of two of uh, hadrons with two heavy quarks and uh, rest light quarks have been uh, proposed by several persons, by, by Rome group, by Carliner and Rosner, Eichten and Quigg, etc. In these cases, you can apply, as I said, the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. And there is another case in which the Born-Oppenheimer approximation has been, has been, has been um, proposed and studied. Here is a small list of references. It's the case of a hybrid, um, a hybrid hadrons. That is, hadrons which have two, two um, CC bar, and then you have only gluon fields. And uh, uh, you try to see whether there are configurations which are different from Charmonium. This is the problem of hybrid hadrons. But uh, we will consider instead another case that is uh, the case in which you have two heavy quarks, say charm or beauty, and uh, one single quark, light, which is the case of a W heavy baryon, or two, sing two uh, light anti quarks which is the case of a doubly heavy theta quark. And this is what I will discuss in this lecture. But first, let me tell you how you deal with the born oppenheimer approximation. And uh, suppose that you have uh, a system with two heavy and two light particles. That's the typical case is the hydrogen molecule. And uh, so you have uh, a... a you have the, the Hamiltonian heavy, which contains uh, uh, the, 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 the kinetic energy and the interaction between the two heavy particles, and, uh, uh, and an Hamiltonian uh, of the light particles in which there are no variables of the, light, of the heavy particles except for their coordinates. And uh, then you can do the, you can first of all try to solve only the light Hamiltonian, considering the heavy particles as uh, classical sources local, localized in the coordinates xA and xB. So you will find the wave function and the eigenvalues that uh, depend from xA and xB, the two coordinates of the two uh, uh, heavy particles. Then you look and suppose you take the, the ground state of that. Then you look to, to solve the Schrodinger equation for a wave function, which is the product of a, a, of a, co, a wave function XA in XA, XB, and the previous F0, which also depends from XA and XB. But this must be a, an eigenfunction of the total energy. Now, that's not so simple because when you apply the, of course, when you apply the, the coordinates, uh, the, the, sorry, the, the derivatives with respect to the momentum of the light quark, that is the derivative with respect to x, x1 and x2, you simply operate on at zero and you reproduce the, 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 the Schrodinger equation for the at zero. But when you introduce the derivatives to xA and xP, you will have derivatives of two kinds. One in which uh, the derivatives act on uh, psi on F0, and the other one in which it acts on psi. And uh, the Born-Oppenheimer approximation consists in neglecting completely the second term with respect to the first term. So you, you say that it is negligible to apply the derivative of xA to F0. Uh, you take only the derivative, the derivative with respect to xA to apply on only psi. And in this case, you obtain a, a, shading, a, a shading equation, which, sorry, which contain, sorry, a shading equation, which contains only which contains which contains only the um, the, the 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 heavy 
coordinates, but a new potential VBO, born Oppenheimer, which is the interaction potential of the, the, the one that you had before, V of XA, XB, plus the eigenvalue of uh, a, 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 the eigenvalue of the previous uh, light equation as a function of XA and XB. It's a, it's, it's a very in interesting approximation because uh, uh, if you are able to compute uh, the eigenvalue A with respect to XA, XB, you get a simpler equation which involves only the heavy degrees of freedom and then you will be able to solve it and this will tell you uh, uh, what is the, the energy of the total system. Uh, it is uh, supposed that uh, uh, the born Oppenheimer becomes uh, exact uh, in the limit where the mass of the light particles divided by the mass of the heavy particles go to zero, but uh, that's a, a, a rather delicate case and you are uh, asked to consult uh, Weinberg uh, book on that, which contains a, a very uh, detailed discussion of this. We will accept that. Now, the, the basic point of the born Oppenheimer are what is called orbitals. That is, what are the orbitals? The orbitals are the solution of F0. Uh, in other words, uh, you can associate uh, uh, light particles to one source or to another, and solve this Schrodinger, Schrodinger equation. And uh, for instance, if you have only one light, um, you, can, uh, you can associate, if you have two light particles and two heavy, you can uh, uh, de 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 define as a, an orbital as the, uh, the solution of the Schrodinger equation with the, the up is associated to charm and nothing else. All the rest is treated as perturbation or where the antiquark up is associated to the antiquark charm and the rest is treated as a perturbation. Uh, the perturbation can be treated to first order and uh, that is, uh, the, this is a form of F0 and uh, this is the, uh, the, the perturbation to the energy, to the, to the energy of F0. So uh, the, the orbital are just the basic wave function which associate one uh, light particle with one heavy particle. And I will indicate how we do. For instance, a typical case is that of helium-2 ion, a system which has two protons and one electron. Two protons and one electron, you have, uh, this is the, the Hamiltonian, and of course uh, you can consider the, the, the one orbital is a, a wave function when you associate one, the electron to, to the proton in XA or the proton to XB. Of course, in this case, the Fx is simply the hydrogen wave function with the nucleus placed in XA and the other one is the, uh, the nucleus placed in XB. And then, and then you will, uh, since uh, the electron can be associated to one or to another, you, the, the lowest energy will be the one in which you take the symmetric combination. Note that uh, these two uh, wave functions are not orthogonal because one has a center in XA, the other one has a center in XB, and you have to, the, to define a normalized vector, you have to, to, to compute the, the overlap. And then the, the born Oppenheimer potential will be given by the interaction of the two uh, protons, the Coulomb interaction of the two protons, plus F0 with H light, uh, where H light is, is computed, the matrix element between, uh, between F0 and in, in the state F0. Of course, with color, we have a, a, a complication and uh, there is a, a color gymnastic to do. And there is also a complication with confinement. And uh, I will show you how we have dealt with that. And uh, suppose that I have a, a CC bar pair fixed as a fixed source. I have to specify also the color and the color can be one 
or eight, but color one will not interact with the light quarks. And so I will not consider that. I will fix my tetra quark to have the, the CC bar in eight color, and therefore the Q bar Q prime also in the eight color. Now, what is the, the interaction between CC bar? That we have seen is just given by the formula that we have seen with the Casimir operators. And the, the Casimir C2 of eight is three. The Casimir C2 of three is four thirds. And therefore this gives you uh, uh, the alpha s uh, um, of, uh, of uh, times lambda cc bar, lambda cc bar is one sixth, is a repulsive interaction. Of course, uh, q bar and q prime are also innate, so that's exactly the same as the QCD interaction of them. And so you have a situation in which uh, um, the, 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 the in, uh, interaction between the two heavy particle is uh, repulsive and the, so is the interaction between the two light particles. It's very similar to the, to the hydrogen molecule in which the two proton repels and the two electrons repels each other. However, you want to know also what are the other interactions. And uh, to do this, you have to do some uh, algebra. And uh, uh, the algebra is again, uh, called the field transformation. In other words, you have uh, that if you put together C bar and C, they are in color eight. You put together Q bar and Q prime in color eight. But what happens if you put C bar with Q uh, prime and C with Q bar? Uh, that's a field transformation. And this has to be worked out with the uh, color matrices, etc. This is worked out in an appendix to our paper. It's a very nice exercise if you can practice. And the result is this combination with square root of two thirds and minus one square root of one third. That says what is the combination of one one and eight eight, but with the C bar Q prime and uh, etc. And therefore you can now say that uh, the interaction of C of uh, say Q bar with C is what is what? Well, there is a probability of two thirds for Q bar C to be in a singlet, in which case the interaction is uh, um, prime, minus four thirds. And uh, there is a probability of one third to be in the octet in which the interaction is one sixth. And so the overall things is minus pi over six. Uh, similarly, if you take the other uh, fields rearrangement, you get the interaction of CQ and C bar Q bar. And you see that the most attractive channel is the one in which Q goes with C and Q bar goes with C bar. So we say we take two orbitals. One is a, a, a bound state uh, uh, CQ and the other one is C bar Q bar prime. And you have to solve the Schrodinger equation for that. However, um, um, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in this case, uh, uh, once you have found that, you, you will let them to, to find uh, the perturbation, etc. However, there are certain delicacies, uh, delicacies with, the, with the thing. Uh, first of all, if you have uh, uh, interaction CQ, you have uh, at, uh, at short distance, you will have a Coulomb interaction. But if you go to larger distances, you will have a string. So you have to do as you do with Charmonium. That is, uh, you have to do uh, to, uh, to sum up the Coulomb part with a confined part. And this is explained in the next, uh, in the next uh, transparency. It is this. This is the, um, the, 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 the thing between the potential between two, two colored sources, whatever they are. And you have a Coulomb term, which for the case of QQ bar is minus four thirds, and a string term, which is a KR, and we know the value of K from Charmonium spectrum is 0.15 GV squared. 
And then you have a constant because uh, this potential is, is confined. You cannot say that the two particles at infinity will have zero energy because in fact, the, the energy at infinity will be infinity. So you have to add a constant that will have to be fixed from a single mass of a particle in, the, in, the, in this potential. But uh, that is not the only point. The point is that uh, what is the value of kappa in, in cases, complicated cases like the one that we have uh, uh, just discussed, in which you have QC or Q bar C bar, etc. And uh, the, the, there is one, one rule which is uh, supported by lattice gauge calculation, which is to say that uh, the coefficient of uh, uh, kappa is uh, the same as the absolute value of the Coulomb coefficient. This is called Casimir scaling because it's a Casimir combination that gives you that. And so uh, if, if you have, uh, if you have uh, a, a, a case where you have a, a general lambda Q1, Q2 uh, for, 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 for the strength of the Coulomb term, you will have to have a, a, a Coulomb potential, which is minus, not for third, I'm sorry, but uh, lambda Q1, Q2 times alpha S over R. And then uh, you multiply the, the charmonium by three quarter to take out the Casimir of the charmonium and multiply by the Casimir that comes out lambda Q1, Q2. And then you have, of course, a constant, etc. So this is the thing that you put to, to compute the orbital. The orbital is uh, computed with the potential like that. And uh, so for instance, the orbital CQ is numerically computed with that and the C bar Q bar the same. But that's not the story. That's not all the story because uh, this in, in this figure, I have, uh, I have uh, uh, simulated the orbitals and I have uh, CQ bound state with a certain radius R, but this is a three bar. And, uh, and the, the other, on the other side, on the, the other side, the, the C bar Q bar is a three. So these two are confined. And uh, if I, if I uh, go, not, not only I have Coulomb forces between these two, which are the Coulomb force between Q and C bar, etc. Those that I have put, I put aside and will compute perturbatively, but I have also I will have to put a confining potential with a certain strength, which of course will depend from the fact that three and three bar. Uh, I will consider also tri triality zero orbital, that is a CQ bar in an eight. In this case, there is a theorem that says that uh, the, the charge of a, a, a representation like that, like the eight, which is said a representation with zero triality, uh, can be screened by gluon. So for states like that, there is no confining potential. And this will happen when I will consider the case of uh, a double, double heavy um, double heavy tetraquark. Uh, apart from that, at, at this point, I can write uh, the born Oppenheimer potential, which is uh, uh, the one that is written here, is the interaction between uh, the two sources plus the correction that are due to the interaction of a residual uh, and uh, the confining thing. And uh, now I have to tell you what I do with V0 because this V0 is, 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 is unknown. It has to be fixed on the mass. Now, in the QQ bar, small Q, small Q bar case, V0 is fixed by the ground state mass. So all this will lead you to no prediction of the mass of the X3872. However, uh, in notwithstanding that, the solution to the born Oppenheimer will give me the wave function of the distribution of C, C bar inside the tetraquark. And this will be an independent information about the internal structure, which as you will see, can be very interesting. 
in the baryon case, uh, that is uh, two charm and one light quark, there is a, an interesting, I can fix the V0 from the boundary condition to satisfy what I called the single heavy, double heavy quark symmetry, and I will explain to you. In the final case of uh, two heavy tetra quark, uh, uh, in this case, the orbitals are eight or singlets, and there is, there is no V0. V0 is fixed by the fact that at infinity, this potential must vanish, and you have to give rise to a two meson state. This is a, a discussion of the, the boundary conditions. And uh, now we can go to, to, the, uh, to the results. You compute the Burke Oppenheimer, you compute uh, the, the Schrodinger equation for the Born -Oppen Born Oppenheimer potential, and you end up with this. This is the case where you have a, a hidden charm tetra quarks, that is CC bar and, and Q, Q, Q bar prime. And uh, uh, what, uh, what I plot here, uh, look at the, uh, and the figure on the left hand side, in blue is uh, the wave, the radial wave function that tells you where the, the heavy sources will be located when you have solved the Schrodinger equation. And uh, you see that uh, it is located that the black, the, the blue dot tells you is in correspondence of the peak of chi -A. So the charm is roughly there and the other charm is in the origin. But uh, the, 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 the green and the, and, the, and the red are the, extens, the extension of the orbital. And you see that uh, if I take uh, the born Oppenheimer with the pure uh, uh, one gluon exchange interaction between the two, um, the quark and the anti-quark, mm, uh, I, I can find uh, this, this situation. And uh, the, 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 there is no separation between the diquark and the anti-diquark. They are essentially intermixed. However, an interesting thing happens if you increase the, 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 the repulsion between the, the quark, the, 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 the QQ bar uh, interaction. And uh, that is uh, 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 the, the figure on the right hand side. You see that the two, the diquark and the anti diquark have been separated. And now, there is in fact a barrier for a, a C bar to go, the two charm overlap. The barrier is indicated by the form of the potential and uh, you are uh, essentially in the valley and, uh, the, and this explains why it is so difficult to uh, annihilate a tetra quark of this kind into say JXI. It's much better. To, uh, to, to annihilate infinity star. So you can see that already this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, we cannot predict the mass, but uh, we can predict, uh, we can obtain a situation which is similar to the one we envisaged in the previous lecture, that is uh, the, the quark and anti-quark separated with all the consequences that that explains. So we were very happy to find that, that with the born Oppenheimer, by pushing the, the, the repulsion between quark and the quark in the eight, we could, we could obtain a situation like that. Um, one thing that I want to note is uh, the, 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 the R is in this figure is given uh, in Jeff to the minus one. And uh, Jeff to the minus one, one Jeff to the minus one, if you multiply by H bar, which is uh, units uh, energy times Fermi, uh, one Jeff to the minus one correspond to 0.2 Fermi. So you see that uh, uh, if you are, if you have here distances between CC bar of the order of four, six, uh, things like that, uh, you have simply to multiply by zero two, 
and you have very compact uh, tetraquark. But if you go to a situation like the one on the right hand side, in which there is a repulsion between the QQ bar, then you have distances which are rather in the order of six to eight um, uh, jet to the minus one, which means something like one to 1.5 Fermi, which is the thing that we were discussing in the previous, in the previous lecture. Now we consider the, 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 the single, the double heavy baryon. Double heavy baryon, uh, we can, uh, we, we have this Hamiltonian. We have uh, um, one single quark, light quark, the square over two m, and the H light has contained two, two uh, Coulomb interaction, and you can consider the orbital that is a bound state between a light quark, one of one uh, light quark with one of the heavy sources or with the other. And this is, is explained in the in the in the picture which is there. Uh, you better you better symmetrize these two uh, possibilities to obtain the lowest uh, the space uh, uh, energy and uh, and uh, and uh, you have simply to add to the to the potential that are written here a confining potential which will start at some point uh, r0 which is uh, when the the the, the uh, second heavy quark is outside of the or on the orbital of the first now um, what is uh, what is the, the 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 energy? The energy is obtained as before by taking the, the, the matrix element of the interaction of the of the interaction Hamiltonian, which have not uh, entered into the, the orbitals, and uh, this contains an, again a constant v zero because you have a confined system. But now you can say, well, what happens if I send to zero the distance between xa and xp. That is, I send xa equal x, xp. I get exactly the situation of the heavy light, uh, uh, single heavy, uh, double heavy uh, symmetry. The two quarks, uh, heavy quarks coalesce into a single source. And uh, that has exactly the field, the QCD field of a, of a, of a meson except that it has a mass which is one MC more than that of a char measure. So if I, if I put uh, to zero the distance, and if I, uh, if I uh, what, what do I have to obtain? I, I, and, and if I subtract one MC, so as to subtract one mass of the heavy quark, I get MC plus MQ plus delta A of zero plus V zero plus a zero orbital. Now that has to be equal to MC plus MQ because this is in the constituent quantity the mass of the meson. And therefore uh, delta A zero V zero must be such that uh, zero plus MC plus MQ plus delta A zero is e exactly equal to MC plus MQ. And, uh, and therefore, that means that essentially that I have to subtract uh, from delta E of R, 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 RB, delta E of zero, you know, in, in such a way that when I go to RB equal to zero, I find the, 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 the Hamiltonian of the meson. And uh, in this case, I could, uh, I, I, I could eliminate the constant and solving the born of an Heimer equation, I can find the eigenvalues and the mass of the double heavy value. Now, this exercise has been also done by Karliner and Rosner with a completely different method. And uh, this is uh, the first column um, uh, explain what, uh, what are the ingredients in the quark model calculation of Karliner and, uh, and Rosner. They start 
by using quark masses, which are the baryon quark masses. And uh, the, the sum of the baryon quark masses make uh, 37, 30, 37 ATP. However, they now consider the CC binding, uh, taking that from the uh, difference between meson masses and charmonium mass and divide by two because one gluon has changed. And that gives a, a, a binding energy of under 29, which is obtained from another calculation. And uh, in that case, you find 36.55 GB. Now, we do a different story. We take always meson masses and uh, we compute uh, the born oppenheimer uh, schrodinger equation and we find a, a, a binding energy which in this case, since there is this subtraction for the, for the symmetry uh, of, the, of the heavy double, uh, it's just plus 24. And if you sum 36, 42, but 34, you get a, up to 10 MeV, the result of, of, of Carlina and Rosen. I find that very interesting because that means that, uh, that it's, it's a part of the explanation of the difference between meson and baryon masses. In our case, we always start from meson masses, even to compute a baryon spectrum, but we, uh, the Born-Oppenheimer potential will have to correct that. So this is an indication that this is not so stupid. Then there is the, we have to add the hyperfine interaction. And here, again, there is another difference between, uh, between uh, Carlinen and Rosner and our calculation. We take minus 30 MeV, the KQC uh, thing, which is taken simply from the mass of lambda C. They made instead a, a, a fit to all the barrier, to all char barrier masses and find the value of minus 42. Of course, they too differ by 12 MeV, which is a small quantity. And that gives another difference of 20 MeV. So you see that in, in the end, we find 36.50, and the, and the Carlin and Rosner 527. They are closer to the experimental value, 3621. But uh, as, as this calculation, as this comparison showed, this I think is not such a fundamental difference. I think that we can say that we can predict the mass up to something like 30 MeV also. And uh, both calculations are in, I would consider, good agreement with the experimental value. Note that uh, we started from the meson, from the quark masses of the meson. And uh, that's, uh, I find quite interesting. And uh, in this uh, table, there are um, the case of Xi CC computed by us, 3650, uh, computed by Carlin and Rosner, 3628, to be compared with 3621. And by lattice QCD, uh, is 36.34. So I think that, uh, that uh, the theoretical description of that is not so, not so bad. Uh, of course, there, is, there are predictions concerning the other, the other doubly charged, uh, doubly, uh, doubly charmed baryons, but we don't have still data from that. I think I will go on now and go to the, to the third case which is the case of a double charred, double heavy tetraquark. Double heavy tetraquark, I have here the cases of BB bar and the cases of CC bar. We have, uh, we, we have taken the, the string as one quarter of the charmonium because, uh, because this is the Casimir, which is appropriate to the case. And uh, we have uh, determined, we can determine B0 from the boundary condition that uh, at infinity, the potential vanishes. And uh, you can see that in, bo in both cases, this is the case. The potential is the, the yellow curve and the, 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 the blue, blue curve is the, the radial wave function and the green line is the eigenvalue. And uh, uh, now uh, in, in, in this equation, I compare the, the, the result of the born oppenheimer which is contained in this E, which is the eigenvalue of the, of the equation. And then uh, we have added 
the spin-spin uh, interaction, BB and QQ. Um, then we have, uh, then we have uh, uh, the pseudo-scalar meson. We have again MB plus MQ uh, minus, uh, and then we have also a spin-spin interaction. And we make the difference, uh, we call it Q, the difference between the mass of the tetra and, the mass, and two times the mass of the pseudo-scalar. And we find a very interesting relation. The, the masses have gone, the quark masses have gone because they are uh, the same uh, before uh, that. There is the born oppenheimer eigenvalue and there are this, uh, this uh, KBB and kappa QQ and KBQ bar, which is the, the, the meson thing. Now, if we take uh, kappa QQ, and recall that the two quark are two antiquark are in light antiquark are in a tree like in, in the baryon. Uh, then I get uh, that uh, QCC is very close to zero. So I would predict the mass of the tetra quark with two charm to be on top of the DD, 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 DD bar. However, uh, when I was preparing this lecture, I, I realized that uh, assuming that this kappa QQ is the same that you, you, you find from the proton, is certainly not so well justified because, uh, because here uh, the, the, the dis distance, the overlap function of the two light quarks in the tetra quark will be different from that of the proton. So you should correct for that. And uh, the correction is uh, to use the wave function to compute the overlap of Q bar, Q bar prime. And we have the over, we have all the wave functions, so we can do whatever we want. We can compute everything. And if we do that, we find a surprise. The kappa QQ in the tetra quark is much smaller than the 100 MeV of the kappa QQ in the proton. And uh, this is due to this geometrical factor. And uh, if you do that, uh, we get a Q value, which is more, more close to the difference between D and D star mass. That is, we get a result, which is very close to the D D star threshold, which is what the experiment find. So that's a good correction. And brings us in better agreement with the estimates of uh, Carlinen and Rosner and Quig and, uh, and Eichten and Quig, which are uh, more or less in the same ballpark. However, we, we, could, we cannot find, having done that, we, now we cannot move anything. We cannot find a, a reason to find such a negative values of the Q value for the BB tetra quark. In other words, uh, uh, we, uh, would have a tetra quark which is now very close for the B to the BB to the BB bar pressure, and we will don't know don't know what is the the the, the real situation. Uh, errors of uh, lattice QCD are still very large, and it's very difficult to say uh, who, who is uh, who is. Uh, right and wrong. And also, I must say that I made this, cal this calculation for the big work rather quickly in, in preparing this lecture. So take that as a preliminary and uh, in, the, in the lecture notes, I will put a more, uh, a more uh, controlled uh, solution. For the moment, I would like to say simply that uh, these are the results that we can say and, uh, and that uh, and that uh, the, our prediction for, for, the, for the TCC is uh, between 3863 and 3847, and uh, the, the, the real value is uh, 3875, which is not so bad. And so this is uh, uh, my conclusion is that uh, with double heavy charm, the born oppenheimer approximation together with many other approximations that we have force to use along the way is, uh, is not a bad, uh, is not bad. In particular, I'm very much uh, interested by the 
the, the, the capacity of uh, the born parameter and the quark model adopted by uh, Rosner and Cardine to get to a very, to a very uh, a similar, similar result, notwithstanding the fact that they start from the baryon, from the constituent quark masses of the baryon, and we start from the constituent quark mass of the meson, and we do that all the time. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Maiani. Questions from the students? I hope that Alessandro tomorrow will be able to answer all your questions. <laughs> I, leave, <laughs> I leave to him this responsibility. I would like to do just one comment. Uh, I saw that you mentioned the, the double charmed baryons, uh, Xi CC, Omega CC, and in C. principle, there is also the Omega with 3C. Um, all of these things, uh, in principle, are in the, as one of the main reasons for the upgraded LHC of ELIS, the ELIS 3, because for the first time, they want to measure it also in, uh, in collisions, uh, ion collisions. Yes. That, that uh, it's uh, interesting because indeed already in proton proton, the first results show that one has a, a productions that is uh, much larger than expected. Production of what? Of the XI CC? Already the XI C as uh, one order of magnitude more than one will expect with fragmentation models. Yeah. And, uh, and also the omega C, both the Xi C and the omega C, it's at least one order of magnitude more. Yeah. Maybe has never been uh, studied if this can be related to, to the structure and the wave function of, uh, of the hadrons itself, the way you imagine uh, its structure. I don't have any comment to make on this, I think. No, it's just to say the, that the production is a very difficult to, to pin down. The production in, in such high energy reaction is very difficult to pin down. Of course, this should be, there's no, 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 no doubt that this should be produced similarly <laughs> to other baryon, etc. I, I, don't, I don't know of any reason why the Xi CC should be produced more abundantly than expected. I don't know. Yeah, it seems uh, that already a coalescence model in proton proton, if we are at the table scale, goes more in the, in the right direction with respect to the simple fragmentation. So that it is highly uh, enhanced because you have uh, the light quarks around uh -huh. the system. It is. But just to mention that they are interested because it's an effect at least of one or the other. It's, it's a happy circumstance because I think we will have more statistics to study. So, yes, yes. That is. Okay, so okay. there are no other questions. Uh, thank you again, uh, Professor Maiani. And tomorrow at you, there will be uh, the last lectures of this series. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.